an eyewitness account of the plight of African migrants in Europe. Will Hillary Clinton's Benghazi testimony help or hurt her presidential chances? And big companies look back to the future with a product blitz. Africa 54 starts right now. Hello, I'm Lenore Moudou. This is Africa 54. The European migrant crisis and how to solve it is continuing to cause strife among EU leaders. Thousands of African migrants are making the perilous journey to Europe in search of a better life. VOA reporter Abdulaziz Osman has just returned from Europe where he met some of the African migrants in Italy, Germany and Austria. And here is his report. Thousands of African migrants continue to flog into Europe from Libyan shores with overcrowded bull boats. The most treacherous and often deadly journey is the one that begins from Libya to Italy. The International Organization of Migration, IOM, says over 3,100 people have died in the high sea before they make it to Europe. In the latest search of migration, European Union naval ships have rescued more than 2,000 African traveling on boats, either drifting or stranded in the high waves. An IOM field officer in southern Italy told VOA that most of the recent African migrants on the move were Eritreans. In the first uh, months until uh, uh, August 2015, the number of Eritreans was 30,000. The number of somewhere more or less 15,000, the number of uh, Sudanese 10,000. This teenager told me on condition of anonymity and with a blurred face that he was among underage migrants who suffered violence at the hands of brutal smugglers. The smugglers have beat me up after ignoring an order to line up. It was inhumane and painful. Among the migrants who made to Europe this year is Rahma Abu Karali, a Somali mother who delivered a baby on a German vessel hours after she was rescued. I met Rahma in Germany last week. I was feeling dizzy. I was tired because of the five-month journey. I could not deliver the baby in Libya, so I was ready to die with my unborn child. Danger not only lurks on the route to Europe, but also these migrants continue to suffer even when they reach in Italy. Some lucky ones line up in Milan to find the temporary shelters for the night. Safiya Mohamed Abdullah is a diplomat at Somalia Embassy in Rome. She says if EU could have helped African migrants, their influx to the continent would hold. The youth want job creation, training and help. If someone has all those in his or her native country, I don't think they would have to run away and flock to Europe. Even though the EU is struggling to deal with the flow of the migrants, there are no signs of African migrants stopping to move and to risk their lives. These African migrants face enormous hardships in their native countries, and not even the treacherous refugees will stop them from trying their luck for a better life in Europe. Joining us now in the studio to tell us more about what he learned on his visit to Europe is Abdulaziz Osman of VOA Somali Service. Abdulaziz, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. So you were in these three countries, Italy, Austria and Germany. Can you tell us what you saw firsthand on the ground in terms of the, 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 the situation that is prevailing among these migrants? Uh, we went to Germany, uh, we went to first to, to Italy, southern Italy, where the new migrants arrive. Uh, we witnessed the arrival of more than 15 new migrants who have been rescued from the sea by the European Union Navy ships. When you see how they disembark from the ship, you could see that they went through hell. I mean, the stories that they told us when they landed is that uh, they risked their lives. They were close, that close to die in the sea. But uh, on the other hand, they were happy that they were rescued by the e European Union, and they were happy that they landed the uh, uh, European soil. But at the same time, they were horrified. So who are those, uh, these migrants when you 
looked at the big picture. Who are some of the people that are coming very often, according to your experience? Families, young people looking for a better life, a woman, children, what can you tell us? I, I think the most of them are men. Uh, 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 very, I mean, there are women included also, and small children also included. It's really hard to see a family actually holding a small baby like less than uh, a year and actually going through or went through that uh, risky journey on the sea. So, I mean, uh, the, most of them are mad, but in, women are children also included. Now, tell us about some of the stories that really uh, touched your heart. You spoke to that woman with her baby. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us about these stories, perhaps one or two stories uh, that you can share. I think w what I really uh, had when I was there is that they told me that the journey that they took was not worth it, even though they were going through it, but they didn't have any option. For example, some of the migrants say the, the way they have been mistreated in Libya or during their journey in Sahara is really unbearable. For example, that Somali lady, the mother who... هدف سازمان خاروبار جهانی از نامگذاری روز جهانی غذا در پیش گرفتن راهکار پایدار برای تأمین غذای سالم شهروندان جهان بوده و از همان آغاز کار بر سازش ناپذیری و اصولی بودن مبارزه با هر گونه سوء استفاده و تقلب در تولیدات غذایی تاکید کرده است با همه سخیری ها و نظارت های همه جانبه سودجویی و تقلب در اقتصاد چند صد میلیارد دلاری بازار جهان پدیده کمابیش رو به رشد و فعال است با آمار رسمی سازمان ملل متحد و به دلیل کمبود نظارت و فساد دستگاه های دولتی تولید مواد غذایی تقلبی در کشورهایی مثل چین و هند بسیار بالا و در کشورهای همچون آمریکا یا کشورهای اروپایی به دلیل اعمال نظارت دقیقتر و مجازات های سنگینتر شاهد تقلب کمتری در مواد غذایی هستیم با این همه ریشه کنی این پدیده سخت دشوار و گاه ناممکن به نظر می رسد تحسیس سازمان های استاندارد و نظارت بر مواد غذایی یکی از راهکارهای مقابله با این پدیده ویرانگرانه انسانی در جهان امروز است ایران نیز یکی از کشورهای دارای پیشینه قوی در برخورداری از سازمان استاندارد غذایی در خاورمیانه با آسیا است اما در سالیان اخیر و با گسترش دامنی تحریم های جهانی و حذف کارشناسان و مدیران با تجربه استاندارد در پیش گرفتن سیاست خودکفایی غذایی به هر بهایی ممکن سوداگران مواد غذایی فضا را مناسب یافتند و چنان بر بازار تولید مواد غذایی ایران چنگ انداختند که تقلب به تخصص اصلی در فعالیت های اقتصاد غذایی ایران تبدیل شده است به گفته وزارت بهداشت جمهوری اسلامی ایران حالا از دو کیلو اسید یک تن آب لیمو و از پارافین روغن زیتون و از شکر مصنوعی اصل تولید می‌کنند نتیجه آشان است که مصرف آب لیمویی که قرار از سرطان زودا باشد سرطان زا می شود. به این ترتیب آیا می توان پذیرفت که سیاست سیستم نظارت و کنترل کیفیت محصول و آنچه در ایران دادن درجه استاندارد نامیده می شود برای تولید محصولات غذایی و لبنی اعمال می شود؟ آیا تلاش دولت ایران برای تأمین امنیت غذایی شهروندان ایرانی کافی است؟ این موضوعات امشب با کارشناسان میهمان افق مطرح خواهیم کرد ولی قبل از آن طبق روال این برنامه در ابتدا به فیسبوک افق سر میزنیم از شما پرسیدیم آیا مسئولیت پذیری مقام های دولتی آزادی رسانه ها در تهیه گزارش تقلبات و هوشیاری مردم در انتخاب مواد غذایی سالم می تواند بازار تقلب مواد غذایی در ایران را کساد کند بسیاری پرسش آری دادید حدود 77 درصد و حدود 23 درصد پاسخ خیر به این پرسش ما و مایل ما از شما دعوت کنم که لطفاً به روال همیشه به فیسبوک افق هم مراجعه کنید و همطور از طریق دیگر راه های ارتباطی نظر گوگل پلاس و توییتر هم لطفاً با ما در تماس باشید و برای دریافت فایل صوتی برنامه هم میتونید به ما ایمیل بفرستید و ما بیننده برنامه زنده افق از استودیوی خبر صدای آمریکا هستید میهمان های امشب افق خانم دکتر مرگم دادخواه متخصص تغذیه آقای دکتر خسرو افسری متخصص بیماری های افونی از کالیفرنیا و حمید مافی روزنامنگار که از برلین با ما هستند ممنونم که دعوت افق رو پذیرفتید 
در ابتدا قسمت کوتاهی از فیلمی رو خواهیم دید که خبرگزاری فارس از محل رهاسازی زباله های شهری یکی از شهرستان های ایران تهیه کرده که به محل چراگاه دائمی دام های اهلی تبدیل شده بعد عنوان کرد که به گفته دیدبان محیط زیست و حیات بخش ایران سالانه یک میلیون کیلوگرم گوشت از دام هایی که از زباله های شهری و بیمارستانی مصرف کردن تولید و for businesses to go there. As well as providing havens for Syrian businesses, Collier argues such industrial zones could attract outsourced jobs from Europe. Germany has offshored masses of its uh, activity to Poland. Perfectly possible for them to offshore it uh, to Jordan. Collier concedes such projects would require huge investment, but he argues the financial and human cost of the current approach will be much higher. Henry Ridgewell for VOA News, London. The East African nation of Tanzania is gearing up for Sunday's presidential and parliamentary elections. Africa 54's Vincent Makori is covering the election and joins us live via phone from the capital, Dar es Salaam. Good evening, Vincent. Good evening, Lenore. It is indeed a countdown to what Tanzanians think might turn out to be a historic election. Excitement is palpable on the streets of Dar es Salaam and expectations are high. I caught up with a number of the potential voters and here is what some had to say. I think the, 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 the main issue is the security, uh, which are the, there are some conditions which you might arise immediately after the election, yep, uh, which is, you can call them uh, stability in the politics. Uh, the, the, the next president should look at it so that the situation is harmonized. Yep. Uh, what about uh, issues of uh, economy, development? Uh, what are some of the areas you think perhaps uh, the past government or the current government could have done better and maybe the next government can do a better job on? Oh, I think is in terms of infrastructure, the roads, transportation, and whatnot. And the, I think the the next president, I I suggest, if he or she can focus in the education, that could be good. I'm expecting the new government that will focus on the main issues, especially to the downtrodden people of Tanzania, who are actually suffering from many issues. Yeah, like education, there is a problem of education. Our education is very poor. Yeah, and many citizens cannot afford to have good education. Yeah, to have better economy and employment to the youth. The youth are so many, and the chances for employment are very few. Therefore, I expect the new government to look on this. Some people say that uh Perhaps one thing this election has done or has not done is to give you a wide variety of uh, leadership uh, from where to choose. The two are veteran. One is uh, older in the age. The other one uh, somehow uh, has also been around the system too long. Do you feel like there could have been a different person maybe could have given Tanzania a better choice? Uh, with me, I'm satisfied with the people who are competing, who are contesting for this election. Yeah, they are experienced. Yeah. Whether they come from CCM or from any other party, they are all competent and uh, I think they will do better for us. So Vincent, uh, tell us what type of reactions people are having with regards to how this election will, will turn out to be uh, Sunday? Well, indeed, as you hear some of those sentiments there, people think this is going to be a very different kind of election. It is probably going to be historic because it is the first time that the opposition seems to have a chat at uh, winning this election. But people are apprehensive at the same time because uh, they, the stakes are so high uh, that there are fears on both sides. The opposition I believe that the ruling party is actually planning to break the election. Uh, the ruling party is also accusing the opposition of uh, inciting people into chaos. So, Vincent, uh, th does the opposition anticipate for free and fair elections? 
the opposition is very suspicious. In fact, uh, recently, uh, the, op the opposition party, uh, one member, went to court to petition against a ruling by the government. Uh, the government said that when people vote, they have to go home immediately. But they said there's a, a constitutional provision that a, a voter can actually stand at least 200 meters away from the polling station uh, until whenever. Now, the opposition believes that the, the call for the government, uh, from the government, people must go home, is because they are planning to steal the election. In, in fact, some voters uh, claim that uh, the ruling party has always rigged okay. the election. And, and because of that, uh, okay. there is a lot of tension that if uh, that happens, it might cause chaos. Okay, Vincent, we have to leave it there. We look forward to speaking with you more this week. Thank you so much for joining us. And that was Africa 54 host Vincent McCurry joining us on the phone from Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Now, we want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54 and check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Follow me on Twitter at Linor Moudou. Coming up, a Hillary Clinton prepares for high-stakes testimony on Benghazi. Stay with us. This is Greenbeat for a healthier planet. Researchers in New York and Greenland are trying to find out why a huge glacier has begun retreating at an unprecedented pace over the last 15 years, and they've enlisted a group of seals to help. The ringed seals are able to go where boats cannot, in and around the Jakobsen Glacier in Greenland's Ilulissat Ice Fjord. David Holland is a professor of mathematics at New York University. He says the seals can go as deep as 500 meters. They transition from the surface to the deep warm waters, and that's what's really important to see that. The seals are outfitted with devices that measure the depth, temperature, and salinity of water. If the water is warm, the glaciers retreat, but as they retreat, they calve ice and sea level rises. Holland says if parts of Greenland and Antarctica were to retreat, sea levels could go up by a meter within a century and have a huge impact on coastal cities, including New York. I'm Rebecca Ward for VOA's Green Beat. Welcome back. Democratic presidential candidate Hillary Clinton testifies before a special congressional committee Thursday probing the 2012 terrorist attacks that killed four Americans in Benghazi, Libya. Clinton was Secretary of State at the time, and her testimony could have an impact on her White House hopes. VOA national correspondent Jim Malone has a preview of the hearing. Republicans are expected to grill former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton about the terror attacks that took four American lives, including U.S. Ambassador to Libya Chris Stevens. But Clinton has seized on Republican comments. The Benghazi committee is targeting her politically. Everybody thought Hillary Clinton was unbeatable, right? But we put together a Benghazi special committee. What are her numbers today? Clinton went on the attack during the recent Democratic presidential debate. This committee is basically an arm of the Republican National Committee. It is a partisan vehicle as admitted by the House Republican Majority Leader, Mr. McCarthy, uh, to drive down my poll numbers. Big surprise. And that's what they have attempted to do. Chairman Trey Gowdy acknowledges his committee is under scrutiny. I have told my own Republican colleagues and, and friends, shut up talking about things that you don't know anything about. House Speaker John Boehner says the probe is about finding the truth, not politics. Benghazi's committee is about what happened before, during, and after a terrorist attack in Libya, where four Americans uh, died. The American people deserve the truth about what happened, period. Clinton opponents are also running ads. I'd like to ask you why you ignored calls for help in Benghazi. Clinton has been in this position before, fending off Senate Republicans at a 2013 hearing. The fact is, we had four dead Americans. Was it because of a protest, or was it because of guys out for a walk one night who decided they'd go kill some Americans? What difference at this point does it make? The political stakes for Clinton are huge, says Republican strategist Ford O'Connell. 
I think the optics of it could really be damaging to Hillary Clinton, regardless of what comes out of that, of that uh, hearing. But Clinton remains formidable, says analyst John Fortier. I think it's hard for Hillary Clinton to change the big perception of her. She's very well known, uh, but that has its pluses and minuses. She is, she's going to have strong negatives. She's had them for a long time. There are plenty of people who know her and don't like her, but she's also got strong supporters. And Clinton got high marks for her recent debate performance and continues to lead her main challenger, Bernie Sanders, in national polls. And joining us here in the studio is VOA's Jim Malone. Jim, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Before we get into the Benghazi issue, Vice President Biden mm -hmm. announced that he will not run for presidential elections. What do you make of it? And what does this mean for Mrs. Clinton, really? Right. We've been waiting for months to hear from the vice president about whether or not he would run. He's been grieving the death of his son in May, Bo Biden, from cancer. Uh, and uh, just today, he came out to the Rose Garden at the White House with President Obama, with his wife, Jill Biden, and announced that uh, he's taken a look at the situation and has decided not to run for 2016. Uh, that takes Joe Biden out of the equation. That leaves the field as it is now. That's Hillary Clinton and her main challenger, Bernie Sanders. Uh, it's probably going to be seen as a boost for Hillary Clinton. She's had a good uh, couple of weeks with her debate performance. And, of course, on Thursday, the issue we're going to talk about, yes. her appearance before the Benghazi committee. And re uh, with regards to this appearance before the committee, to what extent could the hearing be pivotal to, uh, for Mrs. Clinton's um, presidential chances? Well, anytime you're going to be uh, in Congress uh, being grilled by Republicans, uh, there's always a, a, a tense back and forth. We've seen it before with Clinton's appearances before different committees on this issue. Uh, we can expect more. But one of the issues that's come up uh, has been uh, allegations that the committee now has been politicized. Exactly. That was my next question, because some critics say this is becoming a political issue, not, uh, not uh, anymore about Mrs. Clinton's uh, wrongdoings. Uh, well, it was always seen as a political issue. The Republican chairman, Trey Gowdy, has tried to make it about the facts. But some comments by prominent Republicans in recent weeks have cast dispersions on the committee, something that the Clinton campaign has been very quick to seize on. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they're going to try to make the committee on trial as much as Hillary Clinton. We saw in the clip from the recent debate, she was quick to go after the Republicans on the Benghazi committee. And what can we uh, expect in terms of outcome? I mean, there have been several probes in the past yes. on this issue. What will be new this time? We'll hear more about the circumstances of the attack before and after security concerns. Did they get to the Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton? Uh, but also the committee says they have new information, including emails from Ambassador Chris Stevens, one of four Americans killed in the attacks. Uh, so we'll see what new information Republicans have to ask her about during the hearings. And quickly, uh, speaking of emails, there is the issue of the use of a private mm -hmm. email during uh, her work time. Right. Uh, w to what extent will this come up d tomorrow? Well, we'll see if there's any new light to be shed on that issue. It's been an issue that's dogged her political campaign. Uh, and whether or not Republicans have something new to add, we'll have to wait and find out. But Clinton's hoping that she can put that issue to rest, perhaps partly by her appearance before the committee. Jim, thank you so much. We'll be keeping an eye on it with you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, that was uh, our Jim Malone, VOA national correspondent. It's time now for a short break. Still to come on Africa 54. Great start. Companies a jump on the back to the future bandwagon. We'll be right back. If you've just joined us, I'm Maria Madiello, and here is a quick recap of today's headlines. In South Sudan, Uganda begins to withdraw army from the region as part of a peace deal aimed at ending nearly two years of civil war. In Ethiopia, the EU foreign policy chief Frederica Mogherini visits African Union headquarters to discuss a number of issues including migration, economic growth and investment. In Jordan, Tunisian President Beji Kaid Essebi concludes a visit to the country where he and King Abdullah II discussed bilateral cooperation and the Middle East crisis. In Morocco, the government makes progress on funding $9 billion solar power project to develop its own renewable energy. That's all for today. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.
Welcome back to Africa 54. I'm Esther Gidu. You what he is, what's trending. Today, October 21st, 2015, is Back to the Future Day, the day when Michael J. Fox's character, Marty McFly, travels from 1989 to 2015 in the film Back to the Future Part 2. Companies like Toyota, Ford, and Pepsi are taking advantage of the hype around the day to promote their own lines. Soda maker Pepsi unveiled a limited run of Pepsi Perfect, which will be available only today. But only 6,500 bottles have been created, and they are selling for $20.15 each. All three Back to the Future films combined earned more than $956 million at the global box office. Next up, Star Wars fever takes over the world. Twitter said there were more than 17,000 tweets a minute when the trailer aired Monday night and over 1.1 million tweets since then. Facebook reported that 1.3 million people had 2.1 million interactions related to the Star Wars within the first hour of the trailer screening. Even Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg commented on the official fan page writing this looks amazing i love star wars in the uk the movie sold more advanced tickets in the first 24 hours of release than any other film in uk history with over 200,000 people booking their viewing slot and finally chocolate and couture collide for elegant but likely messy fashion show in celebration of the UK's National Chocolate Week, models took to the runway in London for a special chocolate fashion show. Ensembles designed by high-end chocolatiers were featured at the event. One outfit was inspired by the fairy tale character Marle Fassent, while another featured an edible haute couture style dress. Mm, yummy. And that's what's trending today. Lino, back to you. Definitely some tasty looking dresses there. Thank you, Esther. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. For more news, tune in to VOA's evening radio show, Africa News Tonight at 1800 UTC. And in the mornings to Daybreak Africa between 300 and 600 UTC, Monday through Friday. Thanks for watching and good night from Washington. A journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. I'm Sally Field, and I believe women are the best agents of change. These women from around the world are leading the way to challenge the status quo and motivate the next generation. These women bring us one step closer to realizing women's rights as human rights. Only on VOA. Music is something that brings people together. Music educates, it motivates, it's a bridge. Music, Alley, on VOA. I am Sheka Sully, host and senior editor of VOA's international calling talk show, Straight Talk Africa. The issues that we discuss are pertinent to most people on the African continent.